Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess a new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Today is the 21st of the second Adar. It's the 13th month of the Hebrew calendar year, 6001. It is the day before the third quarter Sabbath moon, which always occurs on the 22nd day of the lunar month. And I want to share something that I had discovered, really rediscovered, because I remembered reading it a very long time ago, but it's so very pertinent to the show that I did with Diane Culver last week, talking, Diane and Denny Culver talking about the lunar solar calendar and how it was that the Israelites especially during the Exodus, that the Most High had given them a lunar solar calendar to go by. And we see confirmation of this even when they began to march on Jericho, when Joshua, inheriting the leadership from Moshe, took the Israelites into the Promised Land to slaughter the giants, the sons of Anak, and the Anakim, the Rephaim, the Amalekites, the Horites, the Zamzazims, and all these different giant, hybrid giant tribes that were living in the land and that had bred with the Canaanites as the children of Ham. And that Goliath and his four brothers were also from this particular line. And we see that King Og, the last remnant, he was spared even of the flood, riding upon the ark of Noah, that Noah agreed to feed him and to help him survive the flood as long as he would assist him and his children to recreate and to reestablish order afterwards, which he broke his promise. And that was another reason why God had brought judgment against him. But, um, but it was through his being spared that the rest of the giants and the Canaanites also became involved with that particular bloodline, that particular genealogy. And so anyways, we were speaking about this 354 day lunar solar calendar and how in the book of Enoch, when I wrote my ninth book, Flat Earth, as key to decrypt the book of Enoch, that I was able to understand by revisiting the geocentric biblical cosmology, what it was that Enoch was describing in the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries with regard to the sun and the moon moving through the six gates of heaven and how that particular distance, that portion of space and time had been broken up between what are the tropics of Capricorn and the tropics of Cancer. The tropic of Capricorn being the 
outer and most southerly limits and the Tropic of Cancer being the innermost and most northerly limits for the transit of the sun and the moon as they move and circle across the heavens. And so anyways, what is interesting is a passage that I had read in the Targum translation of the book of Proverbs, which is called Colet, Q-O-H-E-L-E-T, in the Hebrew. And so this particular verse is, it gives confirmation of not only the intercalculary month, the 13th month, but it also, in the commentary, the footnote, it confirms that indeed this is the calendar, the calendar that I created in the 2019 Enochian Lunar Solar Calendar and the current calendar which we have been putting out for the past three years now. Since my work on that book in 2015, I believe I released Flat Earth as key to decrypt the Book of Enoch in June, I believe. Yeah, it was near the end of the summer months of June. And so anyways, um, this passage confirms the whole premise of that calendar and the fact that indeed there is this this 13th month that realigns and readjusts the solar and the lunar calendar so that they are correct in unfolding. And so the passage that I'm referencing is Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 7, which let me look it up in the King James, just to see what it says, and then I'll read it from the Targum translation. Okay. In the regular King James, it says, I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasures of kings of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delight of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. Okay, so, which that's similar to what is in the Targum, but certainly this is excluded from it. And so I'll read what it says in the context of the Ecclesiastes, but I'm going to pull up the whole, the whole image instead of just the, the one passage that I want to reference. So let me see here. Okay, here it is. All right. And so beginning, um, I'll start with verse 6. It says, in the Targum, I investigated a water source which was suitable to irrigate trees and which was suitable to irrigate herbs. I made my, for myself fountains of waters to irrigate from them even a forest which produces many trees. In verse 7, I acquired male and female slaves from the children of Ham and other foreign peoples. I had 12 stewards who were in charge of food for my household. For the 12 months of the year, and one to provide for the 
intercalated months. I also had possessions of oxen and sheep more than all the generations who preceded me in Jerusalem. And so, of course, you don't find this in the King James, but is it not interesting that, you know, the whole mention of the intercalated month is not found in this particular verse, but when you read the, the Aramaic, the original, um, or the translation of the Hebrew Torah, this is what you get. And so, you know, again, this is why it is that I have such a great interest in reading the Targum versions, because I do believe that all of them, with regard to all of the different books of the Bible, they provide so much more detail and so much more information that has, for whatever reason, whether it's purposeful or out of ignorance, you know, I, who knows? I think some of both, really. But a lot is lost in translation. As the theme of what we will be going into this evening as well, which I'm going to be reading the other portion of the Targum of the Psalms, which relay in context and are alluded to the word of God, the word of the Lord as Christ and which the whole, you know, everything connected to him in the 55 different psalms. I mean, that's like one third of all the different psalms um, r relate to him, but have not been translated in such manner that you can make sense of the context of the verse, the passages, and how it connects to Christ as the Son of God. And especially in, I read a lot of verses from the Targum of Isaiah, which show that it is he, Yeshua, that will be the instrument of the wrath of God being poured out on the wicked and those not written into the books of life. And yet that's not at all what we see explained in the verses that you know a lot of people are used to, but which are really watered down. And I hate to say it that way because you know I absolutely know the King James to be inspired in that there's codes written over and that only work uh, on you know on the King James even my friend Bill McGregor who wrote the whole tuning fork he verifies that the 66 books of Isaiah relate you know in a lot of times verbatim to what is written in the King James Version of the Bible in that particular translation. But that still does not um, change the fact that much has been removed and eradicated from the King James, like the names of the Father and the Son and allusion to them. And that's without a doubt. Anybody can confirm confirm that. Everybody knows that they removed the Tetragrammaton and also any word representative of Christ. And they hit it with titles, God and Lord, or Lord God. And so... I'm going to share some of that this evening, but I thought, you know, the whole thing with, and this is, this is from Ecclesiastes. I mean, so this is the book of Solomon that is directly from the Bible. You know, it's not even one of the apocryphal texts, but it is 
one of the main books of the Bible. And, you know, again, there's, as far as the intercalated month or the 13th month, there's only one other place where there's mention of it, and that's in Ezekiel, when he lays on his side for 430 some odd days that applying that math you can only by adding that 13th month can you get that total that he speaks about in that particular verse and so anyways you know in my opinion those are two confirming witnesses from the main uh, you know, some of the main books of the Bible that confirm it as truth and that, you know, this was the calendar which the Israelites were utilizing. You know, the whole day of marching around Jericho for seven days, I mean, that could not occur unless you realize that the, that week, that seven-day count was, the first day was Kadesh, the first day of the lunar month. And then you have the six working days leading up to the first Sabbath. Which we talked about that. Just look up the show that I did with Diane Culver on Yahweh, Yahweh's unique timepiece explained. All right, so we'll go ahead and go into some of these verses as well. Oh, um, let me read also the comment that comes with this particular verse where it says, I had 12 stewards who were in charge of the food for my household for the 12 months of the year and one to provide for the intercalated month. And then the footnote, the commentary, because there are you know, always a lot in these Aramaic Targum translations. It says, seven times in a 19-year cycle, a second month of Adar is added to the Hebrew calendar to ensure the Passover remains in the spring. And so I wrote in a post that I released earlier about how perfect is the timing for Yahweh to lead me to the discovery? Considering this year is one of those that include an intercalated, intercalated month to reset the calendar and realign the spring barley harvest to the waving of the barley sheaf by the high priest on the 16th of Nisan, or the day of first fruits for the sins of Israel. Nothing is by coincidence this occurring is, in my opinion, another confirmation by the Father as to the revelation of this teaching. And I absolutely do believe that, even though I know so many people, you know, follow a 364-day solar calendar. In my opinion, you know, Sabbath is not a once in every seven day thing, but occurs according to the phases of the moon and the appearance of the waxing crescent, which I'm not gonna go into in great detail here, but let me open up um, our other chat and then I'll start reading some of these verses, and I will also be bringing them up in the King James to give you detail as to how they have been mistranslated. So let me pull that up first. Okay, and the first one we're going to be going into is Psalms 97. So if you want to follow along with the readings and look at it for yourself, Psalms 97, verse 12, 
it says in the the Targum, be glad, O righteous, in the word of the Lord, and give thanks at the mention of his holy name. In the in the King James, it says, Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. And so, you know, again, there, there's, there's always this removal of, you know, the word of the Lord. And I think that really initially that the seed of the serpent, the seed of Cain, they had to be involved in it, in the cover-up of Christ as the Son, the Word, the Memra, and the Logos of the Most High God. But, you know, nobody knows for 100% certainty, but, I mean, having it occur over and over and over and over so many times, dozens and dozens of times that's you know you don't make that many mistakes without there being some kind of obvious reason for I mean it's not accidental all those times all right Psalms 104 Psalms 104 verse 34 and 35 in the King James, it says, My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. In the Targum Psalms 104, it says, May my talk be pleasing in his presence. I will rejoice in the word of the Lord. The sinners will be destroyed from the earth and wicked exists no longer. Bless oh my soul. The name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, so, you know, the translation in 34 is what is... Altered. I will rejoice in the word of the Lord. The sinners will be destroyed from the earth, and it is he that will be the instrument of the wrath of God being poured out on the wicked and those not written into the books of life. In Psalms 105, verse 19, it says, until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. Wow, they actually may have translated this one correctly. And I would make mention that even in the last show that I did, there was two instances, I believe, out of all those that I read where they had translated correctly about the word of the Lord. But usually not when, you know, it's reflecting on him as persona. Okay, Psalms 105, 19. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. And so in the Targum it says, until the time when his word came true, the word of the Lord purified him. And so, like previously, not many times previously, but um, they, they did get this one correctly. The Lord, word of the Lord purified him. And we see the word of the Lord tried him in this verse. And then going to verses 24 through 26. And he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. He turned their heart to hate 
his people to deal subtly with his servants. He sent Mose, his servant, and Aaron, who he had chosen. Okay, that would be it. All right, so let's read this here again. In the Targum we have, oh, I'm sorry, this is 106. I need to go to 106. 106, 24 through 26. Yea, they despise the pleasant land. They believe not his word, but murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them, overthrew them in the wilderness. And so in the Targum it's, and their soul was repelled by the desirable land. They did not believe his word. And they complained in their tents. They did not accept the word of the Lord. And he lifted his hand in an oath because of them to throw them down slain in the wilderness. So at least they got one correct in verse 24. They got it right with, they believed not his word. But in verse 25, there's an exclusion. They did not accept the word of the Lord would be the second portion of the verse there. Psalms 107, verses 10 through 16. Okay, looking for the King James. What did I say? 10 through 16. All right. It says this in the KJV. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the word of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and brake their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful work to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. And this is exactly what is spoken about in the, the descent of Christ into Sheol, that there where it makes mention of the bars of iron, the gates of brass, those are the gates of Sheol. And so it's making, it's speaking about when Christ, away from his body, descend, descended down into Sheol in order to release Adam and Eve and all of the other righteous patriarchs that were bound in Sheol. And then he took them to the Archerosian Lake give them over to the Archangel Michael. They were baptized there and then allowed to enter the city of New Jerusalem, which is the paradise of God. All right, continuing. Because there's still quite a bit. From Psalms 112, the first 10 verses. All right, Psalms 112. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness 
endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor his righteousness and earth. Forever his horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved, but he shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. All right, and so in the Targum it says, Hallelujah, happy is the man who fears the Lord. He takes great pleasure in his commandments. His children will be mighty in the Torah. He will be blessed in the generation of the upright. Luck and riches are in my house. And the merit endures forever. Light dawns in darkness for the upright, the gracious, and the merciful and righteous. A good man pities the poor and lends money. He will support his words according to rule. For he will never be moved. The righteous man is destined for eternal memory. He will not fear news of disaster. His heart is firm, trusting in the word of the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he sees redemption in distress. He scattered his health, wealth, and gave it to the needy. His merit endures forever. His might will rise up in glory. And the wicked man will see and be angry. He will grind his teeth at him and rot. The desire of the wicked will perish. And so verse 7 is the main portion. He will not fear news of disaster. His heart is firm in the word of the Lord. All right, going to the other. The next is Psalms 114. And I'm hoping that we can make it through all these. I'm going to read first here the the Targum translation, and then I'll only read those verses that have the mistranslation as far as the word of the Lord. I think that would take less time. And so in the Targum, when Israel came out of Egypt, this is verse one through eight, the house of Jacob from barbarian peoples, the company of the house of Judah became property of his Holy One, Israel, of his rulers. And when the word of the Lord was revealed at the sea, the sea looked and retreated. The Jordan turned around. And so, you know, again, this is at the rebuke of Christ that is said that, you know, the seas fled away at the end of days. Well, this is also what he did to the Jordan River when his people went and dried, went across it and dried on dry land. When the Torah was given to his people, the mountains leapt like rams, the hills like offspring of the flock. God said, what is the matter, O sea, for you are retreating? O Jordan, that you are turning around. O mountains leaping about like rams, O hills, like offspring of the flock. In the presence of the Lord, 
dance, O earth, in the presence of God of Jacob, who turns the flint into a channel of water, the adamant to springs of water. And we know that that's when Moses struck the rock in the wilderness and the water came forth in large bounty and just flooded out certain portions of that land. And so verse 3, verse 3 of Psalms 114, in the King James, the sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. And so, you know, again, there's no mention of the seesaw what? It just says the seesaw it. But what did the sea see? The sea saw the Most High, Yeshua. And that's why he fled and the Jordan retreated. All right, I'm going to continue. Psalms 115. Okay, this one is long. 1 through 12. Not on our account, O Lord, not on account of our merits, but rather to your name give glory because of your goodness and because of your, tr your truth. Why will the Gentiles say, where now is their God? And our God's residence is in heaven. In all that he desires, he has done. Their idols are of silver and gold and the handiwork of a son of man. They have a month, or they have a mouth, but do not speak. They have eyes and do not see. They have ears and do not hear. They have nostrils, but do not smell. Hands, but do not feel. Feel, but do not walk. They do not murmur with their throat. May their makers become like them, everyone who relies upon them. O Israel, trust in the word of the Lord. He is their helper and their shield. Those of the house of Aaron, trust in the word of the Lord. He is their helper and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the word of the Lord. He is their helper and shield. The word of the Lord has remembered us for good. He will bless. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, the small with the great. The word of the Lord will add to you, to you and to your sons. Blessed are you in the presence of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The heavens of the heavens are for the glorious presence of the Lord, and the earth he has given to the sons of men. The dead do not praise the name of the Lord, nor any of those who go down to the grave of earth. But we will bless Yah from now and forever more. Hallelujah. And so there are several passages here. We'll just check on verse 10 through 14. Okay. In the King James, it says, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. So you, you can see how, you know, again, the, the word of the Lord was removed out of all of those verses, 9, 10, 11, 12, four, 
in verse 14 as well. Psalms 116. Just a few more before we get to break here. There's still a lot there. I mean, it's crazy to me how numerous the translations have been um, distorted. Psalms 116. I love, for the Lord will hear my voice, my prayer. For he has inclined his ear to me, and I call to him throughout my days. The sickness of death surrounded me, and the pains of Sheol found me. Pain and sorrow I will find, and in the name of the Lord I will call out, Please, O Lord, save my soul. The Lord is gracious and righteous, and our God is merciful. The Lord observes enticements. I became poor, and it was meet to redeem me. Return, my soul, to your place of rest, for the word of the Lord has rebuilt, has repaid you with good. For you have delivered my soul from being killed, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I have believed, therefore I will speak. In the assembly of the righteous I have sung much praise. I said, when I fled, all the sons of men are liars. How will I repay in the presence of the Lord all his kind favors that are shown to me? The cup of redemption I will carry in the age to come, and I will call on the name <coughs> excuse me, of the Lord. I will repay my vows in the presence of the Lord. I will tell now his miracles to all his people. Honorable in the presence of the Lord is the death, is death that is sent to his pious ones. Please, O Lord, for I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your handmaiden. You have loosened my bonds. To you I will sacrifice the sacrifice of slaughter. A call out in the name of the Lord. I will repay my vows in the presence of the Lord. I will tell thee now his miracles to all his people. In the courts of the sanctuary of our God in your midst, O Jerusalem, Hallelujah. Okay, so the verse of interest in this passage would be verse 7. So Psalms 116, verse 7, Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Yeah, so at least they are consistent. So they missed that one too. Which should say, Return, O my soul, to your place of rest. For the word of the Lord has repaid you with good. Psalms 117, verses 1 and 2. Uh, there's only two verses. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Okay, that one is uh, actually the same. Oh, my goodness. This one is long. Psalms 118. Um, in verse 6 and 7, it says, the word of the Lord is my help. I will not fear. What will a son of man do to me? The word of the Lord is helping me, and I will behold vengeance on my foes. It is better to trust in the word of the Lord than to rely on a son of man. It is better to trust in the word of the Lord than to rely on rulers. All the Gentiles have surrounded me in the name of the word of the Lord. I have put my trust, for I will tear them apart. Uh, it continues, they have encompassed me like 
hornets, they burned like fire in the thorns. In the name of the word of the Lord, I have put my trust, for I will tear them apart. But you have knocked me down to make me fall, and the word of the Lord has given me help. My strength and my praise are fearful against all the world. The Lord gave command by his word, by his word, and has become my redeemer. Okay, I'm going to just, it goes on. Oh, there's a lot. I mean, even in verse 26, it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the word of the Lord. Said the builders, they will bless you from the sanctuary of the Lord, said David. You are my God, and I will give thanks in your presence, my God. I will praise you, said David. Okay, so, you know, David wrote most of the Psalms. And he mentions so many numerous times of knowing Christ as Savior and Messiah. And yet, you don't get a sense of that anywhere in the King James, other than he talks about in timeline, you know, in Daniel chapter 7, he does speak about the Son of Man in his coming, that he will incarnate into flesh form. But again, we don't have any inkling that David knew of and worshipped and gave and leaned on the word of the Lord in the manner that is conveyed here. All right, we'll be right back, everyone, for second hour. back everybody for second hour i'm your host zen garcia this is momentary zen here on revolution radio anyways let's get back to um the i am reading from the targum of psalms which for those that don't know the tar targum just means translation and it is the aramaic rendition of what is the ancient Hebrew. And so, you know, these translations in a lot of times actually even predate the Greek and those particular texts. Like, for instance, the oldest Targum is the Aramaic in the first one, the translation of the Hebrew Torah into Aramaic, and it dates back to the 4th century B.C. When the, uh, when the Israelites were allowed to leave the bondage of exile in Babylon and return into their homeland, they had the blessings of Darius and Cyrus to rebuild their temple. And because both of them had seen themselves in the prophecies laid out by the Israelites, uh, they trusted and they financed and backed not only the release, the rebuilding of the Holy Temple, and then the reinstitution of worship, which, you know, because they assimilated Aramaic as their predominant lexicon during that 70 year diaspora. It was necessary to translate the Hebrew into Aramaic, and so they just authorized the Targum as translation, and 
we have now the English translations of those Aramaic translations, which are incredible because it gives us an insight into the translations of what was the original Hebrew Torah, which we can no longer find in the manner that we had previously. And so looking at and examining these particular texts, you see how they are different and how they provide so much more information on things that have been excluded from the original manuscripts or that were lost in translation that did not make it down in context to the English, the King James, and the other modern translations, but which have been preserved in the other ancient teachings that have been preserved. All right, Psalms 21. A song that was uttered on the ascents of the abyss. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. When shall come my help? My help is from the presence of the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow you your foot to falter. Your guardian does not slumber. Behold, he does not slumber and he will not sleep. The guardian of Israel, the Lord, will guard you. The Lord will overshadow you an account of mezuzah affixed on your right side of your as you enter by day when the sun rules the morning demons will not smite you nor will the lilis at night when the moon rules the word of the lord will guard you from all harm he will guard your soul the lord will guard you going out for business and you're coming in to study Torah from now and forevermore. So verse 7 of 121. Uh-oh. Verse 7 of 121. Verse 7 of Psalms 121 in the King James says, The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. Uh, yes, there does not be, seem to be a, a connection to the word of the Lord once more. Psalms 124. A song that was uttered on the ascents of the abyss composed by David. Had it not been for the Lord who was our help, lest Israel say now. Had it not been for the word of the Lord who was our help, when a son of man rose against us then they would have swallowed us while alive. When their anger grew strong against me, then the waters would have washed us away. Sickness would have passed over our soul. Then the king would have passed over our soul. He would, who is likened to the malicious waters of the sea. Blessed is the name of the Lord who has not handed us over as dead meat to their teeth. Our soul is like a bird, saved from the traps of the fowler. The trap broke and we have been saved. Our help is in the name of the word of the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. Okay, I'm taking this to you. In verse 2, had it not been for the word of the Lord. So let's see. In Psalms 124, verse 2, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us. And so we see that one is also incorrectly translated. It should, had it not been for the word of the Lord who was our help, when a son of man rose against us. All right, continue. Psalms 125. A song that was uttered on the ascents of the abyss. 
The righteous who trust in the word of the Lord are like Mount Zion. It will not totter. It is inhabited forever. Mountains are round about Jerusalem, and the word of the Lord is round about his people from this time and forever. For the scepter of wickedness will not rest on the lot of the righteous, so that the righteous will not stretch out the hand to deceit. Be good, O Lord, to the good, and to those upright in their heart. But those who go astray following their perversity, the Lord will make them go to Ghana. Their portion is with the workers of deceit. Peace be unto Israel. So, verse 1. Verse 1 of Psalms 125. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. And so, here we see, again, that in the Targum, a song that was uttered on the sense of the abyss, the righteous who trust in the word of the Lord are like Mount Zion. It will not totter. And it is inhabited forever. All right, Psalms 126. All right, let's see. A song that was uttered on the ascents of the abyss when the Lord makes the exiles of Zion return. We were like the sick who were healed. Then will our mouths be full of laughter and our tongue with praise. Then will they say among the Gentiles, the Lord has done great good to these. The Lord has done great good to us. We are joyful. Oh, Lord, make our exiles return like a land that is made inhabitable, where fountains of water flow during drought. Those who sow with tears will harvest with praise. He will surely go with weeping. The ox with bears, a load of seed, will surely come with praise. When he hears, when he bears his sheaves and grazes on the young, growth from the furrow. All right. Um, we're going to Psalms 127. A song that was uttered on the ascents of the abyss, composed by Solomon. If the word of the Lord will not build the city, its builders labor in vain. If the word of the Lord is not guarding the city of Jerusalem, its guard has stayed. In vain will you trouble yourselves to rise early in the morning to do robbery, who stay up late to do fornication, who eat the bread of the poor for which they labored. Honestly and truly, the Lord will give sleep to those who love him. Another targum, the wicked say to the righteous, it is wrong for you that you rise early and pray in the morning and stay up late in the evening to study the Torah, eating the bread of sorrow. The righteous reply, Truly the Lord gives to those who love him a complete reward for hunger. Behold, the legacy of the Lord is proper sons, children of the womb, are a reward for good deeds. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are as sons of the youth. It is good for a man that he fill his academy with them. They will not be ashamed, for they will dissipate, dispute with their enemies in the gate of the place of the judgment. So just the very first verse there. Psalms 127, verse 1. We're almost through, actually. So we might have time to 
share commentary on something else. All right, Psalms 127 in the King James. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. All right, and so, you know, again, if the word of the Lord will not build the city, its builders labor in vain. If the word of the Lord is not guarding the city of Jerusalem, its guard has stayed awake in vain. Okay. Now, the, the next verses that I'm going to go into are specific to, in context to speaking about the Messiah. And they use often even that term, which we know that the Messiah, that even in a lot of the older witnesses, there is what well, speaks about the Messiah and the coming son. All right. Okay, Psalms 18. I'm going to have to backtrack here for a second. Apologize. And there's only a few, I believe. There's maybe three, three or four verses, I think, like that. Okay, Psalms 18, let me see. Verse 32. Let me find the verse. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. All right, let me see. In Psalms 18 in the Targum, verse 32, it reads like this. For because of the miracle and deliverance that you will perform for your Messiah and for the remnants of your people who will remain all the Gentile nations and tongues will confess and say, There is no God but the Lord, for there is none beside you, and your people will say there is none mighty except our God. We know that at the end of days when the harvest ensues and the wheat are gathered for preservation, the tares for burning, that then all the nations will be brought before the Most High before the Son, and that all of them will confess and know him as Lord, as King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if they don't confess that, then they will be not be numbered amongst the elect, and they will be cast out into outer darkness. And so it's something that the whole world will know. And then it tells us in Isaiah that from each Sabbath to each Sabbath and from every new moon to every new moon that there will be a reverence, a worship, a celebration, and a praise that is directed to the Most High God because the Father and the Son the Holy Spirit will be God willing that we are numbered amongst the elect, but those that are worthy will openly walk and be with and among the presence of the Most High God. And what an incredible day that will be. All right, Psalms 21. You know, just some of these verses are just completely different. I mean, you do see similarities in the Targum and that of some of the King James translations, but a lot of times there's just so much extra detail that completely excluded. And so, you know, the whole meaning of those verses, they get lost and... and and so it's it's difficult for people to really glean the message of those particular passages and those particular scriptures 
unless they do a parallel study, which is what I like to do in trying to find out the fullness of what a verse, a chapter, or a passage is really speaking about. And then looking up the the terms in the Hebrew or in the Greek, that that is also a way to gain greater clarity as to what the Most High is trying to convey within that passage or that scripture. And, um, and also to see what has been removed or what has been lost in doing the parallel study. And so I like to look at, of course, the, the ancient Aramaic, the Targum studies, the Greek Septuagint translation, which is the second oldest, and then the modern English translations, whether you're looking at, you know, depending on what particular verse or passage or scripture, there's many different English translations, especially modern ones, but then you can go and you can look at also the the ancient, you know, some of the more ancient than the modern English. Uh, even the Latin Vulgate or looking at the Sinaitic Palimpsest um, that dates back to the 2nd century AD. But, you know, it's difficult to find some of those. Uh, but there are a lot that have been preserved, and so you can easily do these kind of studies for yourself. I know it's, you know, it's difficult, especially for those that are on a budget, to get access to all of the Targums because they are so very expensive. There's only one, one place and one set that has been released, and they're all hardback. And they're beautifully done, but they are quite expensive to gain, to get hold of. And usually you only have like two or three, you know, two or three books. Like for instance, Job and Proverbs and Colette are all t together in one Targum hardback edition and and so but you have to you know there's a lot of them and sometimes you can find some of the paper uh, the paper Targum translations like for instance of Isaiah they have this one that is really good um, that has the Jewish Bible the King James and also the ancient Aramaic Targum, all side by side by side. The Targum in the center, uh, the modern English on the left side, and then the Jewish translation, if that's indeed what it is. It could be, you know, modern English. I, and so... But I do, you know, if you can, and a lot of them are are starting to somewhat become available online. Um, still very difficult to find, but at least for the first five books of the Pentateuch, we have released them all in one in one book, and that's the Palestinian and the Jerusalem Targum all together side by side and compiled one on top of the other. And so just examining those which are the most ancient and the most well-respected and the most acknowledged, well-recognized, that you can see just from reading those, just how much has been excluded and also how much more detail, how much more information you get uh, just from studying that translation. All right, so Psalms 21 in the Targum, it says, For praise, a psalm of David. And I, I think I said this too in the last show, but that often in the 
Targum of the Psalms, you'll see that the very first verse is about the context of the psalm, which is a song, you know. It's a song that David wrote. And what perspective, who the, you know, the person was that is supposed to be the perspective that the song is sung from and in one context. Uh, and so understanding that, you gain so much clarity on what would be the rest of the psalms. A lot of that has been excluded from the King James. And so here for praise, the Psalm of David. O oh Lord, in your strength, the King Messiah will rejoice and how greatly will he exult in your redemption. You have given him the desire of his soul and you have not withheld the expression of his lips forever. For you will make good blessing go before him. You will place on his head a crown of refined gold. Eternal life he asked of you. You gave him length of days forever and ever. Great is his glory in your redemption. Praise and splendor you will place on him. Grace you will give him blessings forever. You will gladden him with the gladness that is from your presence. Because the King Messiah hopes in the Lord and through the favor of the Most High, he is not shaken. The blow of your hand will reach all your foes. The vengeance of your right hand will find all your enemies. You will make them like a fiery furnace at the time of your anger, O Lord. In his anger, he will swallow them up, and the inferno of Gehenna will consume them. You will make their children perish from the earth, and their progeny from the sons of men. Because they plotted evil against you, they thought evil thoughts, but they could not prevail against you. Because for your people, you made them one porter in the ropes of your tabernacle. You will prepare their way before them. Stand up, O Lord, in your might. Let us sing praise and dance in your strength. So I'm going to look up just where those, you know, the verse about the Messiah. In Psalms 21, verse 2, let's see what it says here. Psalms 21, verse 2, Thou hast given him his heart's desire and hast not withholden the quest of his hips, of his lips, Selah, for thou preventest with the blessings of goodness. Thou settest a crown of pure gold on his Head. All right, one more. In verse 8, Psalms 21, verse 8, it says, Because the King Messiah hopes in the Lord, and through the favor of the Most High, he is not shaken. In verse 8 in the King James, it says, Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. All right, one more. Psalms 45. Actually, there's a few more, but I think there's like three more. But I don't know that I'm going to get to all these. Oh, my goodness. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Psalms 45. For praise concerning those who sit in the Sanhedrin of Moses, which you spoken in prophecy by the sons of Korah, a good lesson and a psalm and a thanksgiving. My heart desires fine speech. I will speak my word to the king. The utterance of my tongue is quick like the pen of a fluent scribe. Your beauty, O king Messiah, is greater than the sons of men. 
The spirit of prophecy has been placed on your lips. Because of this, the Lord has blessed you forever. Let's see what that says there. In the Psalms, verse 3. Psalms 45. Psalms 45, verse 3. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. Yeah, nothing about the Messiah there. And then... Okay, I'm going to skip that one. And we'll go to Psalms... 61 verse 9. Therefore will I praise your name forever when I pay my vows in the day of the redemption of Israel in the day the King Messiah is anointed to be king. We know that's not the end of days. The great and terrible day of the Lord. Psalm 61 verse 9. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever that I may daily perform my vows. Completely different, isn't it? Therefore will I praise your name forever when I pay my vows in the day of the redemption of Israel and in the day the King Messiah is anointed to be king. I mean, half of that was left out. Oh, also verse 7 says, you will add days to the age to come, the days of the King Messiah. His years are like the generations of this age and the generation of the age to come. He will dwell forever in the presence of the Lord, goodness and truth from the Lord of the world will guard him. Let's see if they got any of that right. Verse 7. Thou wilt prolong the king's life and his years are... As many generations, he shall abide before God forever, O prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him. Yeah, completely different. You think it, they're speaking about the king, but they're speaking about the Messiah. All right, let's go to Psalm 72. Composed by Solomon, uttered in prophecy, O God, give your just rulings to the King Messiah and your righteousness to the son of King David. Let him judge your people in righteousness and your poor with just rulings. The inhabitants of the mountains will lift up peace for the house of Israel and the hills in purity. He will judge the poor of the people. He will redeem the sons of the lowly. And he will purge away the oppressor. They will fear you at the rising of the sun. And they will pray in your presence before the light of the moon for all generations. He will descend like the favorable rain on the grass that is cut because of locusts. Like the drops of late rain that drip on the grass of the earth. Okay, that's very long. Okay, I'm going to skip down to Psalm 80. But these are very different. Especially when you take the whole context of Messiah out of these verses. God, Sabaoth, turn now, look from heaven and see and remember this vine in mercy and the branch that your right hand planted and the King Messiah whom you made mighty for yourself. It is being burned by fire and crushed. They will perish because of the rebuke that comes from your presence. Let your hand be on the man to whom you have sworn with your right hand, on the son of man whom you made mighty for yourself. We will not turn away from the fear of you. You will sustain us and we will call on your name. O Lord God, Sabaoth, bring us back from exile. Shine the splendor of your countenance upon us, and we will be redeemed. 
Okay, that was Psalms 80, so let's check one verse there. Okay, Psalms 80, where it says, God, Sabbath, turn now, look from heaven and see, and remember this sign of mercy, and the branch that your right hand planted, and the King Messiah, whom you made mighty for yourself. It says, And the vineyard which the right hand hath planted, and the branch that thou madest strong for thyself, it is burned with fire, it is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts, lay down from heaven, and behold, and visit this vine. Yeah, so changed again. All right, just a couple more. Psalm 89. How long, O Lord, will you remove your presence forever? How long will your rage burn like fire? Remember that I was created from dust. Why have you created all the sons of men for vanity? Who is the man who will live and not see the angel of death? Who will deliver his soul from his hand and not go down to his grave forever? Where are your favors which were from the beginning, O Lord, which you swore to David in your faithfulness? Remember, O Lord, the disgrace of your servant I have borne in my bosom, all the insults of many peoples. For your enemies have scorned, O Lord, for they have scorned the delay of the footsteps of your Messiah, O Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord in this age. Amen, amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord in the age to come. Amen, amen. So, Psalms 89, verse 52. It says, Wherewith thine enemies have reproached, O Lord, wherewith they have reproached the footsteps of thine anointed. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. Yeah, so everything about the Messiah. So everything about the word of the Lord, most all the passages which allude to or are connected to in any way the word of the Lord as the Son of God or as Savior Messiah and all the references to him as being King Messiah and coming into his his crown of glory at the end of days. All of that has been removed. You ask yourself why? And it's got to be purposeful deception. Because why would you specifically remove all the passages about the Messiah? has to be the seed of the serpent, the children of Cain, trying to, you know, hide the fact that Christ had come and was the fulfillment of the long-awaited prophecies by the Old Testament going forward that he was the way, the truth, and the light. I can't explain it otherwise. It can't be a mistake. It has to be purposeful. It's too exact. Now I'm going to give you, just as a bonus, and we'll end with this. This is the Targum of Megalot. And it speaks about the end of days and about the coming of the Messiah. And so I'm going to read a few verses which are centered on Yahushua. In verse 1-8 it says, The Holy One, blessed be He, said to Moses the prophet, If the assembly of Israel, which is compared to a beautiful young woman who my soul loves, wishes to wipe out the exile, let her walk in the ways of the righteous, let her order her prayers by the mouth of the shepherds. 
assistance and the leaders of her generation let her teach her children which are compared to the kids or goats to go in to the synagogue in the house of study and by that merit they will be sustained in the exile until the time when I send the king, the Messiah, who will lead them in rest to their dwelling place, the temple that David and Solomon, the shepherds of Israel, will build for them. Verse 117, Solomon the prophet said, How beautiful is the temple of Yah that was built by my hands from cedar, but even more beautiful will be the temple that is destined to be built in the days of the king, the Messiah, the beams of which will be from the cedars of the Garden of Eden, and the pillars of which will be from fir, juniper, and cypress. And so there will be a new temple built for the king. How incredible. All right, this is about in the day's prophecy. Verse 714. And when it will be the Lord's will to redeem his people from exile, the king, Messiah, will be told. The term of the exile has already been completed, and the merit of the righteous has released its fragrance before me, like the aroma of balsam and sages of generations have been standing fast at the gates of study, occupied with the words of the scriptures and the words of the law. Now rise and receive the kingdom that I have reserved for you. At that time when King Messiah is revealed to the congregation of Israel, they will say to him, Come, be as a brother to us, and let us go up to Jerusalem, and let us suck with you the judgments of the law, just as a suckling sucks at his mother's breast. All the time that I was taken away outside my land, as long as I was mindful of the name of the great God and gave up my life, for his divinity, even the nations of the earth would not scorn me. I will lead you, O king, and bring you to my temple, and you will teach me to fear before Yahweh and to walk in his ways, and there will partake of the feast of Leviathan and it will drink old wine preserved in the grapes since the day of the world was created, and from the pomegranates and the fruits prepared for the righteous in the Garden of Eden. The assembly of Israel will say, I am the chosen of all nations. I bring Tephilin of my left hand and on my head and fix the mezuzah to the right side of my door and a third of the height from the lintel so that no demon has power to harm me. King Messiah will say, I adjure you, my people, house of Israel, why are you warring against the nations of the earth to leave the exile? Why are you rebelling against the forces of Gog and Magog? Wait a little longer until the nations who come up to make war against Jerusalem are destroyed. And after that, the Lord of the world will remember for you the love of the righteous and let it be his will to redeem you. Solomon the prophet said, When the dead will come to life and mount of olives will be split, and all the dead of Israel come forth from beneath it. And even the righteous who died in exile will come from under the earth by way of caverns and will come forth from beneath the Mount of Olives. And the wicked who have, dead been, who have died and been buried in the land of Israel will be cast up as a man throws up a stone with a stick. Then all the inhabitants of the earth will say, what was the merit of this people that have come up from the earth? Myriads upon myriads as on the day when they appeared beneath Mount Sinai to receive the law. At that hour, Zion, mother of Israel, will bear her children, and Jerusalem will receive her captive children. Uh, I've got so much more, but I, I'm just have to stop after that. The children of Israel on that day will say to their Lord, We beseech you, set us as the seal of a ring on your heart, as the seal of a ring on your arm, so that we may never again be exiled for the love of your divinity is as strong as death, and the jealousy which the nations harbor against us is as powerful as Gehenna. The eternity which they harbor against us is like the coals of the fire of Gehenna, which Yah created on the second day 
of the creation of the world, to burn the idolaters with it. The Lord of the world says to his people, the house of Israel, even if all the nations like the waters of the great sea were to gather themselves, they could not quench my love for you. And even if all the kings of the earth were to join together like the waters of a river flowing with a strong current, they could not sweep you from the world. And if a man gave all the wealth of his house to buy wisdom in the exile, I would restore it to him double in the world to come. And all the spoil taken from the camp of God would be his. All right. God bless all. Good night. I got much more, but we don't have time. Shalom. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. 